Hey, it's AAA. Welcome to a Rare Scripted video. Today we're going to go through what I think are the top 15 common magic items in D&D 5e. After you guys enjoyed me talking about D&D cantrips for a while on that tier list, I thought I'd talk about some common magic items. They might be the lowest rarity, but that doesn't mean they're the worst. These tend to be more fun, silly, situational, but not necessarily bad. These are my opinions. Uh... It's not a definitive, like, absolutely these are the best and will always be the best, especially because some of these are from newer things like uh, Strixhaven and Tasha's, so this list would obviously change with the publication of other books. But it's also, I'm kind of just using an excuse to talk about some common magic items, because some people just don't know these are a thing. They just think they started uncommon, and common magic items are exclusively just potions and crap, which is not the case. Keep in mind, a lot of the common magic item tier belongs to flavorful items. And the first one is technically one of those, with other purposes being the Cloak of Many Fashions. Its description reads, while wearing this cloak, you can use a bonus action to change the style, color, and apparent quality of the garment. The cloak's weight doesn't change, regardless of its appearance. The cloak can't be anything but a cloak. Although it can duplicate the appearance of other magic cloaks, it doesn't gain their magical properties. This came to us from Xanathar's, and I think you can immediately see where this is going. Um, if you use a disguise kit and wear a cloak of many fashions, you will have much more flexible disguising than if you just had a disguise kit. Because being able to make your clothing magically into another cloak, a cloak becoming any other kind of cloak, surprisingly versatile. Say you're a wizard who needs to blend in with a group of druids, stow your hat, Use your cloak in many fashions. You just got a leg up that you wouldn't have had before. But you might be like, Trip, disguise self. Yeah, but like, that's a spell slot. <laughs> and some people are terrified to use their spell slots outside of battle. I see it all the time, especially with new spellcasters. They're scared to take things like disguise self. Or alter self. And items like this can give you a way to save some of those precious spell slots. And give you still that same amount of flexibility. Our next one actually comes from Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos, and it is the Cuddly Strixhaven mascot. I actually had this in a campaign I was in, in Spelljammer, and it reads as follows. Representing one of the mascots of Strixhaven, this soft, tiny magic toy is perfect for cuddling. If you press it to your arm, shoulder, or leg as an action, the toy stays attached there for an hour, or until you use an action to remove it. The toy can also be used to fight off fear. When you make a saving throw to avoid or end the frightened condition on yourself, you can give yourself advantage on the roll if the toy is on your person. You must decide to do so before rolling the d20. If the save succeeds, you can't use the toy in this way until you finish a long rest. This is an adorable item to give to the wholesome kid character, whether that's a player character, an NPC, or just a player character that has that kind of cutesy energy which was the case in our Spelljammer campaign, and it's useful. Being able to give yourself advantage on fear is useful. Situational, sure, but with a good DM, it'll come up if you have something like this. And it gives a nice grounded approach to make your character, or NPC, or whoever, show their softness and innocence through an item, which I always like to do. I like to show, not tell, even though it's, with D&D, it's basically always tell. Next up is a much more practical magic item, the Coin of Delving. Comes to us from Wildemount. This copper coin sheds dim light in a five-foot radius. If dropped a distance greater than five feet, the coin issues a melodious ringing sound when it hits a surface. Any creature that can hear the chime can determine the distance the coin dropped based on the tone. Hey, it's the coin from Hitman. <laughs> That's basically what this is. And if you've ever played Hitman, you know how useful a bright, shiny ding of a distraction can be. If you need like a second or two for someone's head to be turned, coin of delving. It's also especially great if you have a way to retrieve it. Be it mage hand, a familiar, even a string, I guess, if you really <laughs> want to hold on to the... That little bit of yarn as you throw your coin of delving can be very useful. Uh, with artificers who were able to replicate common magic items, low level, 
Not a bad idea for a very cheap thing to infuse that you can make use of if you're unsure of what to do with your infusion slots. Though as an artificer main, come on, we know there are better uses, but it's still worth mentioning. Next up we have a magic item you probably have heard of if you've been playing D&D for a little while, Ruby of the War Mage. A popular of min-maxers everywhere, this common magic item, which requires attunement by a spellcaster, comes to us from Xanathar's Guide. Etched with Eldritch Runes, this one-inch diameter ruby allows you to use a simple or martial weapon as a spellcasting focus for your spells. For this property to work, you must attach the ruby to the weapon by pressing the ruby against it for at least 10 minutes. Thereafter, the ruby can't be removed unless you detach it as an action or the weapon is destroyed. Not even an anti-magic field causes it to fall off. The ruby does fall off the weapon if your attunement to the ruby ends. If you have a DM who's a real stickler for your hands when it comes to casting spells and the semantic components and the material components, you might need one of these if you're playing something like a cleric. Um, or, you know, wizard. I've seen wizards need this. I've seen druids need this. It, but it all depends on your DM. Some DMs just don't like the idea of a spellcasting focus you can wear around your neck, take a free hand and put it on to cast a spell. Sometimes they'll make you hold your spellcasting focus the whole time. Or sometimes you just don't have the ability to grab onto a spellcasting focus around your neck. Or don't like some DMs don't like the idea of thing, classes like sorcerers being able to cast without one. So, Ruby of the War Mage has solid practical uses, but admittedly limited. I'm not as big of a fan of it as most people are, thankfully because I typically have DMs who aren't this pedantic that I would need to do this. Although, I did use a variant of it which we'll get to in the honorable mentions. Next up we have the Orb of Shielding. This comes to us from Eberron, Rising from the Last War. It's a common attunement item. An Orb of Shielding is a polished spherical chunk of crystal or stone attuned to one of the planes of existence. If you're a spellcaster, you can use this orb as a spellcasting focus. If you're holding the orb and take damage of the type associated with the orb's material, you can use your reaction to reduce the damage by 1d4 to a minimum of 0. And then there's a table listing all the types. It can give you resistance to fire if it's made of fernian basalt, radiant if it's made of iranian quartz, acid and poison if it's made of kytherian scarn, lightning and thunder if it's made of lamanian flint, Necrotic if it's made of Mabarian Obsidian, Cold if, it, if it's made of Rizian Shale, Force if it's made of Savarin Chert, and Psychic if it's made of Zorian Marble. Um, again, it's a cool spellcasting focus. I like flavorful spellcasting focuses, but I think the reason I like this one more than the Ruby is, one, it can be used by things other than spellcasters. I don't like items that can only be used by X class or X category. Also, it's kind of a cheaper poor man's absorb elements for lower levels, or it lets you just shave a little bit of damage off of something, especially if you know it's the type of damage you're going to take a lot. Say you've got a reckless war lock, or specifically fiend lock, sorcerer, wizard, a basalt orb could help you out. If you're a reckless spellcaster, something like the basalt could help you out. In my case, I actually recently got this after writing this list for my Artificer, for Acid and Poison, which is very useful given I have a, ma a magic item called the Bag of Body Parts that when I reach my hand in, any body part can come out. Now I have something without using one of my precious spell slots that can decrease the damage I'll take if I pull out, say, a Gallbladder or a Snake's Poison Gland. Situational, requires attunement, but early on, or for classes who don't need so many of these, I think they're definitely worth having for a common damage type. Next up, we have uh, the opposite of what I was talking about. We have one specifically for class. We have the Dark Shard Amulet. Comes to us from Xanathar's Guide, and requires attunement by a Warlock. This amulet is fashioned from a single shard of resilient, extraplanar material, originating from the realm of your Warlock patron. While you are wearing it, you gain the following benefits. You may use the amulet as a spellcasting focus for your warlock spells, and you can try and cast a cantrip you don't know. The cantrip must be on the warlock spell list, and you must make a DC 10 Intelligence Arcana check. 
If the check succeeds, you cast the spell. If the check fails, so does the spell, and the action used to cast the spell is wasted. In either case, you can't use this property again until you finish a long rest. Pretty straightforward. It lets you, basically once per long rest, try and use a cantrip you don't have. That's really useful. Especially because the Warlock spell list for cantrips is great. And it lets you take advantage of one you might not have. The DC 10 Intelligence Arcana check might be harder to make than you think because a lot of Warlocks don't keep Intelligence. Most p players in general don't keep Intelligence. I'm in the rarity who enjoy Intelligence. So the Dark Shard is going to be one below our next list item, which is the same thing in a different font because of that Intelligence DC. Up next from Xanathar's Guide, we have the Hat of Wizardry. Requires attunement by a wizard. This antiquated, cone-shaped hat is adorned with gold crescent moons and stars. While wearing it, you gain the following benefits. You can use the hat as a spellcasting focus for your wizard spells. Additionally, you can try to cast a cantrip that you don't know. The cantrip must be on the wizard spell list, and you must make a DC 10 Intelligence Arcana check. If the check succeeds, you cast the spell. If it fails, so does the spell, and the action used to cast the spell is wasted. In either case, you can't use this property again until you finish a long rest. Two big reasons this one's better than the previous. Actually, three. One, the wizard spell list for cantrips is a little bit bigger and a little bit more diverse. And even though you have one more cantrip than the class before, you're going to struggle to fill out those slots. Additionally, you're better at the arcana check than a warlock would be. And thirdly, this is a bit of a weird one, a hat versus an amulet. I've had DMs rule that the amulet you would need to hold the cast from, but the hat you wouldn't. Because it'd be really weird to, like, in intently hold on to your hat brim as you cast a spell. Whereas, it's pretty common, especially among holy casters, to wear their, cast their casting focus around their neck and hold on to it. So I've had a lot of DMs rule that this item, due to its nature and how it's worded, you should be able to cast hands-free. I personally am not sure how I would rule on that. I've not been in that situation. But it's something worth noting. Also, the wizard's spell list for cantrips has sapping sting and on and off. One from the Dunamancy spell list and one from the UA list, if you include technology in your campaign. Both of those are very good cantrips that otherwise aren't worth taking or can't be taken in the case of sapping sting that it could be useful to draw upon in a moment of need. Next up, we have one that's a bit more... I would say a bit more practical. We're starting to get to the really good ones. These are basically all common magic items I'd be happy to see. The first one is the earring of message. The blue crystal on this earring is wrapped with delicate copper wire. The earring has five charges. While wearing it, you can use an action to expend a charge and cast the message spell. The earring regains 1d4 plus 1 expended charges daily at dawn. This comes to us from Critical Role called the Netherdeep, and it's a splendid item. Message is a great cantrip. It's hard to fit it onto your cantrip list for a lot of the classes that get access to it. This is a great way to occasionally be able to use message in a clutch situation. I love it. Great item, well balanced. There's a reason you'll see it in a lot of campaigns, even if other Critical Role content, like Blood Hunters, aren't present. This next one felt required to be added here. I wasn't going to add it originally, but I changed my mind at the last minute writing this script. It is the Potion of Healing from the Dungeons Master's Guide. Because the common Potion of Healing heals for 2d4 plus 2. You all know what a Potion of Healing is. It's a red potion. You drink it. You get health back. Most people think potions, scrolls, that kind of crap is the bulk of the common magic item list. Which if you look at it, which I showed in this video, that's not the case. But... It's a staple of the common magic item list for a reason. It's common, it's cheap, it's good. It can save party members' lives. Or it should. I'm looking at you, my rogue player, who is too slow to feed me my potion of healing on my monk. Next up, we have the Feather Token from Eberron Rising from the Last War. This small metal disc is inscribed with the image of a feather. When you fall at least 20 feet while the token is on your person, you descend 60 feet per round and take no damage from falling. The token's magic is expended after your land, whereupon the disc becomes non-magical. 
Hey, you know the spell Featherfall and how useful it is? What if instead of having to have it prepared at all times and be ready to cast it as a reaction at any moment's notice, you could just put a little disc in your pocket and be saved from a fall that could have killed you or hurt you otherwise? That's what this item is. They're common, so if you have, you know, an artificer, you could have this every day, or have someone amongst you have it every day. Additionally, be pretty cheap to buy from a magic item shop if you happen to have one in your campaign world, and they save you from the really embarrassing death of falling. Especially for spellcasters or, like, big, strong martial characters, a fall to your death can be really embarrassing, and they hurt a lot. So if you don't have someone with feather fall, feather token might not be a bad idea for you. Next up, we have the Masquerade Tattoo from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This common magic item does require attunement. However, it's worth it. Produced by a special needle, this magic tattoo appears on your body at, as whatever you describe. So, right off the gate, you get a cool tattoo. That's perfect for you. Love it. Tattoo Attunement. To attune to this item, you hold the needle to your skin where you want the tattoo to appear pressing the needle there throughout the attunement process. When the attunement is complete, the needle turns into the ink that becomes the tattoo which appears on the skin. If your attunement to the tattoo ends, the tattoo vanishes and the needle reappears in your space. While attuned to it, as a bonus action, you can shape the tattoo into any color or pattern and move it to an area of your skin. Whatever form it takes, it is always obviously a tattoo. It can range in size from no smaller than a copper piece, to an intricate work of art that covers all your skin. Disguise Self. As an action, you can use the tattoo to cast Disguise Self, DC 13 to discern the appearance. Once the spell is cast from the tattoo, it can't be cast from the tattoo again until the next dawn. If it just had fluid ink, this would have been lower on the list. It probably would have taken the place of the cloak and the cloak would have moved up one. But the fact that it also gives you Disguise Self every day makes it worth it. It's like a hat of disguise, but once instead of at will, but you also get an awesome moving tattoo. Also, magical tattoos are awesome. I want more people to know about them. On to the next entry. <laughs> the next one we have is from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and it's the Clockwork Amulet. This copper amulet contains tiny interlocking gears and is powered by magic from Mechanus, a plane of clockwork probability. A creature that puts an ear to the amulet can hear faint ticking and whirring noises coming from within. When you make an attack roll while wearing the amulet, you can forego the de rolling the d20 and get a 10 on the die. Once used, this property can't be used again until the next dawn. So yeah, uh, not one? Nope. Clockwork amulet. I've had DMs rule on this differently. Whether you can forego rolling the d20 means... Before you roll, you need to not roll and just take a 10. Or you can forego the rolling d20 and take a 10. I personally think, based on how it's worded, rules as written, you can use it to make a 10. Rules as intended, though, I don't think so. But I think enough of the community disagrees with the rules as intended and likes the rules as written because it's cooler and better that way, that I'm totally fine with that. I had this on one of my first D&D characters, used it literally every single dawn on my wizard named Arthur. He was great. Next up, we have another great magic item from the common tier, the Spell Rot Tattoo, coming to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. When you saw the Masquerade Tattoo, you probably figured this would be on there, and you're right. I'm not including any individual scrolls on this list, I'm including something that's better and cooler than a scroll. A scroll that doesn't need your hands... A scroll you don't need to frantically pull out of your bag. A scroll that can be on your character forever and not be needed until a clutch moment. I'll read the description now. <laughs> Produced by a special needle, this magic tattoo contains a single spell up to 5th level. Wrought on your skin by a magic needle. To use the tattoo, you must hold the needle against your skin and speak the command word. The needle turns into ink that becomes the tattoo, which appears on the skin in whatever design you like. Once the tattoo is there, you can cast its spell, requiring no material components. The tattoo glows faintly while you cast the spell and for the spell's duration. Once the spell ends, the tattoo vanishes from your skin. The level of the spell in the tattoo determines the spell savings throw DC, attack bonus, 
spellcasting modifier ability, and the rarity. And then there's a chart. The common ones can be cantrips or first level spells. You get a plus three modifier, saves of DC 13, attack bonus of plus five. That's respectable. The reason why I like this item so much. One, doesn't require two mitts, so you can have multiple of these kind of tattoos on your person. Two, I'm an artificer main. Artificers can make these, and it makes for a very cool way of helping out your party members every day that's not just, like, enchanting their items, it's literally giving them tools. Which is ironic for the tool-based class, the Artificer, to use their tools to give other people tools, i.e. casting spells, that they otherwise would need to have a free hand for to grab a scroll from. Also, spe uh, Artificers can't make scrolls, so this is their equivalent of scrolls. I feel like it was intentional from Wizards of the Coast's group that... This doesn't count as a scroll. It was introduced alongside the, all the changes to Artificer. It's clearly an intended thing. At least in my opinion, it's clearly intended. The amount of coincidences that have to be required is astronomical. But it's great. It's versatile. There are so many cantrips and first level spells that are worth having around on a spell rock tattoo that I might actually make a video all about first level spells and cantrips that you want on spell rock tattoos. I'm playing an Artificer in a campaign with a lot of time skips, I would be crafting the ever-living frick out of these to arm myself and my party for the dangers of the world, which is great because it has a new DM in it who is struggling to learn things like combat balance, and they love that this is a thing that my artificer can do to give all of the party more versatility. That's why it's my number three. The only reason it's not my number one is it is DM required. Your DM has to have a big impact on this. Obviously, the DM decides what spells you can draw from from cantrips or first levels. If you can make it, if you can find it, how many you can have, all of that is DM required. This is the best common magic item if you have a cool DM. I know pickers can't be choosers when it comes to DMs. I'm grateful to know several good ones, so I will now move on to what I think are the two best DM, DM irregardless. I guess DM regardless? Sure. DM regardless magic items. But before I do that, I want to go over some honorable mentions. I'm doing the honorable mentions now because I think these two are tied. The next two are tied depending on if you're playing a spellcaster or a martial character. But my honorable mentions that deserve calling out but aren't technically good enough to be here are the wand sheath. If you're a blade singer, get a wand sheath. It's awesome. Not only is it a strictly better Ruby of the War Mage, because you don't need to be holding a weapon for it, it's a rod or wand of your choice in your arm. <laughs> so if you get a wand of fireballs, click clack, boom, you have a wand of fireballs concealed in your arm that you can pop out at all times, like Samus's arm cannon, to incinerate your opponents. Also, it's iffy whether... The wand sheath, which becomes one with its wand, shares the same attunement slot as a wand. Some DMs might let you have an attunable wand in that slot, attuned to the wand sheath, and it counts as one. As a DM, I personally would do that, because part of Warforged are like integrating technology into themselves. That's a fundamental thing about them. So that makes sense. Also, it's just freaking cool as hell. <laughs> For obvious reasons, since it's the most specified you can get in terms of requirements, you need to be a Warforged race specifically, it's not on my top 15. But if you're playing a Warforged, you should keep an eye out for it if you're playing a spellcasting one. There's also the Arm Blade, which is cool to a slightly lesser extent, but still very cool. Next up is the Hat of Vermin. You may have heard of this item. It's been around a long time. These days, it's really good, especially if you're a variant feature ranger from Tasha's. This gives you a free scout every single day. Some eviler players will use these little guys to try and trigger traps. Don't be in the second category. I beg of you. But having a hat that you can pull out random vermin from, from the list, is great. I love it. It's silly. It's whimsical. It's also occasionally useful. The last of these is the key charm. Awesome item. 
It's a key. You put it in, turn it, there's a chance of unlocking it regardless of what it's for. You can pull a key charm, put it into a box that has a way higher DC. If the dice be in your favor, ta-da-da, it's unlocked. The only reason it's not on there, it requires attunement. Which, for a key that only has a small chance of success regardless of what you put it in, it's not really worth an attunement slot. Unless you use it to try and break things the DM has planned. In which case, they'll just fudge the key charm roll anyways, and it will, still won't help you. <laughs> now, what I think are tied for the two best magic items from the comments here in D&D. If you heard a thud, it was my headphones falling off my head, don't worry about it. If you were a martial character, I rank this at number two. The best common magic item is from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and it's the Moon Touch Sword. In darkness, the unsheathed blaze of this sword sheds moonlight creating bright light in a 15-foot radius and dim light for an additional 15 feet. It's a better torch made of moonlight that's a sword. It's awesome. Also, it's a magic weapon, meaning it overrides resistance to non-magical weapons. Also, it glows like the moon. And keep in mind, it specifically says that it sheds moonlight. The inverse of something like the Sunblade if you need something that can't be out in the moonlight, or something that's affected by moonlight, like a certain kinds of lycanthrope, depending on how your DM plays them, moon touch sword. If you're a low-level party, and your DM's not so great at balancing, <laughs> and you come across something with resistance that you can't overcome, because you're a pure fighting class and you don't have casting dip, moon touch sword. If you just want a really awesome torch, moon touch sword. It doesn't require attunement. You can just have this thing, along with whatever other gear you've got. It's fantastic. You are never upset to have a moon touch sword, unless maybe you happen to have another magical weapon, and you can't carry them both. Even in that case, give it to someone in your party who doesn't, or an NPC who doesn't, or just accept your moonlight -like torch and be happy with it. <laughs> now, what I think is slightly better... Though I'm biased as a spellcasting primary character, player, I guess I'm not a character, I just make characters, <laughs> I've only ever played one character who has had no spellcasting ability, and it was the monk I mentioned before. It's the imbued wood focus from Eberron rising from the last war. The reason these two were technically tied is because Eberron's a book that's not drawn from very much. So it's unlikely you'll see this, unless you have a super flexible DM, or just a super cool DM. Who knows about the awesome stuff in Eberron? It does require attunement, so as the levels get on, you might not be able to keep this. But it adds early on focus into styling your character towards an element or elements, and that's great. I always encourage people who are wanting to get into D&D and to get into their character, give them not only theming and backstory, give them a way to fight. Give them a unique fighting style. Something that's them. Give them an element to focus on. Or a specific way of doing certain spells you plan on casting frequently. It'll make you enjoy the combat a lot more. D&D is primarily rule-wise combat. So if you can't get through the combat, then the good RP moments aren't going to feel as great because you suffered, well, air quotes, suffered through the combat. So to people who are struggling with the combat, I try and help them learn to make that combat be as fluid and be as expressive as an RP conversation or RPing like some body language or something. And the Imbued Wood Focus helps you do that. It's a, a tunable spellcasting focus. It can be a rod, staff, or wand. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Couldn't read for a second. From a tree infused with extra planar energy. When you cast a damage dealing spell using this item as your spellcasting focus, you gain a plus one bonus to one damage roll of the spell, provided the damage is of the type associated with the it item's wood. So no, if you use this on something like Scorching Rays, it's not a plus three. But what it is, 
is it gives you from the onset, because common magic items are typically given out between levels 1 and kind of at maximum 5. Basically, after that, I almost never see them in any campaign I watch or play. Gives you an early reason to kind of build that focus for your character. Give them an element to focus on. Give them a reason to do so. Give them a unique flair. It's going to make your character a lot more fun to play. Uh, on the, here, you've got uh, the same first words as before with the orbs, but now types of wood. So you have Fernie and Ash for fire. I re I re I want to make I, can, oh, I said it right the first time. I can't say it right this time. And I've done this one way too many times. The Eerie and Rosewood for radiant damage. The Kytherian Macneil for acid or poison. The Lemanian Oak for lightning or thunder. The Mabarian Ebony for necrotic. The Reesian Pine for cold. The Shavar and Birch for force. And the Xior and Wenge for psychic. Plus one damage might not seem like a lot. But in D&D 5e, those plus ones, plus twos, go a long way in making you better statistically, but in this case, giving you that focus early on to style your character around will help you get invested in the character and want to keep them around. I hope you enjoyed this little list. Feel free to suggest other things I should list or talk about or do a tier list of. Uh, next time, I plan on doing the first level spells and cantrips for the infused tattoos. I haven't decided if that'll be in a tier list fashion or kind of like this, where I'll just name off some ones you might not have considered or just name off all of the good ones and why I think they're good. Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Other than that, peace out guys. Hello, what's happening? It's that man in black and green. Sometimes sweet and saccharine. Sometimes he bees as mad as me. Insanity, persistently, forever entertaining.